Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me here. This is, this is very exciting for me. Um, it's very exciting for my kids who are excited that this will appear on YouTube. Now dad is a celebrity, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, anyway, um, I, um, as Chandra said, um, I have done a lot of work um, on neutron stars, on radio pulsars, and on black holes. Uh, recently, we've done a lot of work on fast radio bursts, which has been a topic of some excitement. It's appeared on the cover of Nature a couple of times. Um, and I play a very, very small role in the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, uh, which produced this iconic image of the black hole in M87. Um, if we have time, we'll get to touching on those topics a little bit. But what I really want to talk to you guys about is gravitational waves and how we are building a galaxy scale gravitational wave detector. Um, so with that, let's get started. All right. Um, I like to start with this image of someone poking their head behind the curtain a little bit. Um, and it conveys to me this idea of the world being knowable. Right? This, is a, this is an engraving that is of dubious provenance, I guess. But it somehow conveys this idea of peeking behind the curtain and figuring out how the universe works. So for this talk, I want you guys to take away maybe three ideas. Um, the first of these, the most important thing, is that the world is knowable. It needn't have been this way, but this idea that the scientific method with observations, inference, modeling, and prediction can give us real knowledge, um, that is really important. Particularly in our current climate, it seems like this is an idea that needs to be emphasized more and more. The second big thing I want you guys to take away is this idea of gravitational waves and how they are offering a new window on the universe. So unlike all the other wavelengths that we think of, which are all finally forms of light, radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays, these are all forms of light. But gravitational waves are a completely different new messenger. And we've only just begun to open this window on the universe. So it's a tremendously exciting time. I will tell you a little bit about how we've done this and what we've seen so far. And then the final thing is um, a saying that Carl Sagan used to um, emphasize over and over again, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so, for example, with fast radio bursts, the very first thing that people jumped to was, oh, maybe it's evidence for aliens. And it's very, 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 very probably not aliens. Right? It is just not. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the scientific method is built so that we can get to these, we can build evidence and chains of causality and eventually get real knowledge about the world we live in. OK? So um, this talk is a little bit packed. There's a lot of different things that I'll tell you about, which could be their own talks on their own. Um, but we'll see how it goes. All right. So the first thing I want to start off with is this discovery of radio pulsars. And this is a picture of one of my scientific heroes, Jocelyn Bell. Um, she's standing in front of the telescope. It doesn't look much like a telescope. It's basically an array of these long wavelength dipole antennas. Um, this is the radio telescope that she instrumented up by hand. And she was a PhD student working on this project to actually study um, interplanetary scintillation. And while she was going through the output of the chart recorders by hand, miles and miles of chart recording, because she was a good scientist and because she really, really knew her instrument, this is actually a picture of the original chart recording, she noticed this bit of scruff. And this bit of scruff did not look to her trained eye like any of the other bits of scruff on here. Instead, this looked interesting. And it came back every day at the period, not of the Earth's rotation, which is 24 hours, but at the period of rotation of the sky around the Earth, which is 23 hours and 56 minutes. And so you could tell that, OK, she could tell that, OK, this is something in the sky. What could it be that was producing these little bursts of radio waves as it went through the telescope? Um, ha ha, joking, but maybe not really. They named it LGM1 for little green men. Joking, but 
And then they found LGM2, and then they found LGM3, and it became fairly clear that it was not, in fact, anything to do with aliens, but it was some natural phenomenon. Um, today, we understand that these pulsars are actually neutron stars. They are the tiny, dense little remnants left behind when massive stars explode. And when these massive stars explode, they spew out the elements that have been synthesized in them into the atmosphere, into the space. And then what may be left behind in certain cases is this incredibly massive, incredibly dense, condensed ember of a star. Um, for scale, here it is on the San Francisco Bay. It's about 10 kilometers in radius. And it's incredibly massive. It's about one and a half times the mass of our sun squeezed down into that tiny area. Now, neutron stars are a completely fascinating topic. We can and we do, in fact, teach entire college courses about them. Um, and they make for these great stories. Their magnetic fields are strong enough that if you replace the moon with a neutron star, it would erase the credit cards in your pocket. That kind of magnetic fields we're talking about. Um, and a teaspoon of neutron star matter weighs about as much as Mount Everest does. So it's absolutely exotic form of matter. What's interesting about them, and for the purposes of this talk, we won't really go into neutron stars at all, except to say that we understand that because these are extremely tiny, extremely magnetic stars, and because they are spinning on their axis, they have this beam of radio emission that is spun around. And it, each time it sweeps across our line of sight, we get a blip of radio emission. Okay? So we don't quite perfectly understand what produces this beam of radio emission, but we do understand why they pulse, because they're spinning like a top. It's this lighthouse model. And so that's what this looks like. Each time the beam sweeps around, you see a little blip of radio emission. And that's great. Okay. Um, this rotation rate is extremely, extremely stable in some cases. And in some cases, it is stable enough that it can actually rival some of our atomic clocks. Now, these are radio waves. But if you took this radio pulse and converted it into sound, if you did that, here's what one might sound like. Each time you hear that click, that's basically a rotation of this massive neutron star and that beam of radio waves being swept across our line of sight. Now, that was a pretty sedate radio pulsar. This is B083345. It's the Vela pulsar. It's one of the millisecond pulsars. And again, each of those clicks is one, one and a half times the mass of our sun spinning once on its axis. Right? The fastest ones are actually spinning faster than a kitchen blender. They are really, really fast. OK, great. Let's hold that thought, because this could be its own talk. But let's set aside these celestial clocks. And now let's talk a little bit about gravity. So what is gravity? Well, Isaac Newton, while he was sitting under his apple tree, this is one of the famous descendants of that apple tree. And the apple supposedly falls on his head. And he realizes that it's not just the apple falling to Earth, but the Earth falling to the apple as well. Every particle in the universe attracts every other particle. Right? So that was Newton's model of gravity. And it's an incredibly successful model. It's a model that's successful enough for us to precisely navigate spacecraft all the way across the solar system. But then Einstein comes along, and he comes up with a different conception of gravity. This is where I put up an equation for general relativity, and half of you fall asleep immediately. So we won't do that. Instead, I have a little picture that shows you what Einstein's model looks like. Einstein's model says that matter tells space-time how to curve. And then space-time tells matter how to move. Okay, this is basically what the equations of GR tell you. That matter, without the presence of mass, is this uniform thing. But then you place mass in it. And like a rubber sheet, it bends. And then other masses move in this bent rubber sheet. And those are the gravitational trajectories. So that's sort of the summary. Okay. Um, this of course, was an incredible, incredibly different conception compared to Newton's conception of every particle in the universe attracting every other particle. 
And so it led to entertaining magazine covers like this. Was Einstein wrong, right? Was he wrong? Um, and the consensus is this is a theory that has been tested over and over and over again. And so far, it passes with flying colors. Now, that doesn't mean it's right. In fact, we know that Einstein's description of the universe is not complete because that description is not reconcilable yet with quantum mechanics, which is the other incredibly successful theory of nature that we have that describes things on very small scales. However, it is a very, very good description. It's been tested extensively. And now if you think about this description of space like a rubber sheet that stretches in the presence of mass, you immediately say, OK, maybe it can have ripples. Maybe it can have ripples in space-time itself. And those are gravitational waves. So Einstein's conception implies the existence of gravitational waves. And this is what might happen if a gravitational wave were to come out from behind the screen and towards you. You would have a ring of particles stretch and squeeze, stretch and squeeze. And there's two different modes in which this stretching and squeezing can happen. So there's a plus mode and a cross mode. Okay. So those are the two modes of gravitational waves. Now, OK, do gravitational waves really exist? Well, here now, to go back to those neutron stars that I talked about before, we can time some of these neutron stars with exquisite precision. And some of these neutron stars are in binary systems. So we can actually watch those binary system orbits change because of the ticking clock, sometimes moving away from us, sometimes moving towards us. We can trace the orbit. And here is what the traced orbit, the orbital, um, this is basically one of the parameters of the binary orbit, the shift of the periastron. And you can see that it changes over time as the years tick away. And this line that's drawn through here is basically the prediction from general relativity. You can see that it is a spectacularly successful prediction. It is just an absolutely astonishing fit to what the observations show. Right. And so as a result of this discovery of this system, um, Hulse and Taylor won the Nobel Prize in 1993 because they showed that the reason for this shift is that these neutron stars were radiating gravitational waves and spiraling in towards each other. They were losing energy by the radiation of gravitational waves. Right. So this demonstrated that the gravitational waves must in fact exist and be real and be exactly like Einstein had predicted. But this was still an indirect detection of gravitational waves, because we are detecting the effect of the radiation of gravitational waves. Can we detect them directly? Well, people went ahead and have done very, very complex numerical simulations of what that would look like. I'm going to show you here a picture of this gravitational wave in spiral um, and merger simulation. In this case, the two blue dots are neutron stars. But all the way until the merger, Basically, the waveform looks the same as it would look if it was something more massive than a neutron star. And that would, of course, be a black hole. Um, after they get close enough for the neutron stars to interact tidally with each other, things look different. But in the meantime, this here down here is what the gravitational wave waveform looks like. You can see these ripples being emitted. And then as they spiral in towards each other, the ripples get bigger. And they also start getting closer and closer to each other. So you have this chirp more and more. And now they're beginning to interact tidally. And then this is the merger of the system. And then what's left behind is a ring down as space time stabilizes after the formation of this more massive thing from the merger of two neutron stars. This is the output of a simulation. Okay, there are people who work on numerical relativity simulations, and they do this kind of thing, and that's great. Um, this was, there are credits up here. Um, can we detect them directly? Well, the big problem in detecting the stretching and squeezing of space itself, you can't just hold, your, hold up a meter stick and detect that, because your meter stick is also going to stretch and squeeze. So it becomes a really difficult conceptual question, how are you going to detect that? Einstein tells us that there's one quantity that does not change, and that is the speed of light. Right? So you can use that. And what you can do is you can build a detector where you have two arms. And each of those arms, you're going to shine a laser down. 
and they're going to reflect off of mirrors at the two ends, and then they're going to come back. And you're going to compare their time of flight down those two arms with each other. And now if a gravitational wave passes by, one of your arms will squeeze a little bit, the other arm will stretch a little bit. And the light will reflect and come back a little earlier on the squeeze side compared to the light going down the stretched side. And so you should be able to see that the crests and troughs of the wavelength of the light no longer line up, and instead you get a shift in this interference pattern. Right? So you build one of these detectors, and then you realize that what we are talking about, the stretching and squeezing, is much smaller than the size of an atomic nucleus across the length of these arms of these detectors. Okay? And so when you in the lab order pizza and the pizza delivery truck shows up, that's enough rumbling in the ground to produce a signature that is going to swamp your gravitational wave signature. So how are you going to tell this apart from all the false positives of seismic rumbling and tides and winds and everything else? Um, you have to have a second copy of the detector. And then a signal is astrophysical and real only if it is seen at both of the detectors. And so these are the two LIGO detectors, one in Hanford, Washington, and one in Livingston, Louisiana. Um, there's also the Virgo detector in Europe, and then there are other gravitational wave detectors being built around the world. But this event, gravitational wave event 150914, on the 14th of September 2015, is the first direct detection of gravitational waves. And you can see here the waveform at Hanford, the waveform at Livingston, Louisiana, and then below it, the comparison to the theoretical models for what it should look like if two massive black holes basically merge with each other and emit a burst of gravitational waves. So this is a twofer. It tells you it's a direct detection of gravitational waves. You've seen it from the stretching and squeezing of the arms of your detector. And also, it is a demonstration that black holes must exist, because this is what the waveform is predicted for these black holes. So now we've done, we've gone a fair amount, and there are lots of these gravitational wave events that have been detected, including massive black holes merging with each other, and then GW170817, which is the first detected binary neutron star merger. So just like the binary neutron star that Hulse and Taylor detected, which were losing energy by inspiraling towards each other, except millions of years further along in their lifespan when they actually merge and produce a burst of gravitational waves. And that was GW170817. Um, we estimate that maybe a third of practicing astronomers around the world are on papers related to this one event. Um, it was just this absolutely incredible bonanza because unlike black hole mergers, neutron star mergers put out a lot of stuff. And so it was not just the gravitational wave astronomers, but the electromagnetic astronomers who could get in on the act as well. We now know of all of these masses in the stellar graveyard from detections by LIGO and Virgo. We know of binary neutron star mergers. We know of black holes that have merged to form larger black holes. And if you look at this table, it tops out at maybe about 80, 100 times the mass of our sun. These are definitely black holes. But can we go larger? can we go to supermassive black holes, right? Well, let's back up a step, and let's look at some pictures of the sky for a second. Um, this fuzzy blob in the middle of this image is a picture it, at optical wavelengths of Cygnus A. At optical wavelengths, it looks like a fairly unremarkable galaxy, this fuzzy little blob. At radio wavelengths, it is one of the strongest radio sources in the sky. Okay? It is this absolutely incredibly bright thing where there's a bright hot dot at the center, and then it's putting out these gigantic jets of radio emission. Okay. What could it be? This is the composite multi-wavelength image. And this image should tell you why modern astronomers are so insistent that we need telescopes at different wavelengths. This white patch left behind in the middle is the optical image. The blue is the X-ray image, which is showing you the hot gas in this cluster of galaxies. And then the reddish color in this image is the radio image that I showed you. And together, they paint a very different picture than just the optical picture showed. Right? It shows you that at the center of this galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole 
that is feeding on gas and then shooting out these jets of particles into the intergalactic medium. Right? It's an incredibly energetic system, and we understand that the supermassive black hole that is powering the system is about two and a half billion times the mass of our sun. So we've gone from 100 times the mass of our sun to two and a half billion times the mass of our sun. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about a supermassive black hole. Where did this supermassive black hole come from? Um, let's take a quick look at the Virgo cluster. This is a cluster of galaxies. It's about six and a half million light years away. And if we zoom in on one of them, this giant elliptical galaxy is Messier 87, M87. It's a large, well-known galaxy. If you zoom in on it at optical wavelengths with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see that the inside has this optical jet. It's a jet of material ejected at very high velocities. It looks one-sided because this side is actually aimed towards us and therefore appears brighter. The other side is aimed away from us and therefore is fainter. Um, if you look at it at radio wavelengths, it looks very, very different. You have this huge, large-scale jet-like structure at radio wavelengths. And then you can say, OK, and we zoom in. So this little patch, which in this image appears burnt out at radio wavelengths, is what we are zooming in on in this image. And now you can zoom in further onto the jet. And you can zoom in even closer in. And you can see that at its center, there is this blob. Right? And this blob, when you image it with a telescope that is the size of the entire Earth, and you image it with high enough resolution and at high enough frequencies, you basically get this picture, which is the shadow of a supermassive black hole in the center of M87. This is the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration put this image out um, last year, and it was an instantly iconic image. Um, what it tells us is that there's a 5 billion solar mass black hole at the center of this galaxy, and it's surrounded by gas in this accretion disk, which is moving at 2 million miles per hour. These are just mind-boggling numbers. They're not just astronomically large numbers. They're maybe large enough numbers in the realm of economics now. Like they're <laughs> economically large numbers. Um, OK, so where did these supermassive black holes come from? Um, we understand that galaxies grow by merging with each other. We understand that in the distant universe, mass assembled in this hierarchical fashion, where little galaxies merge with big galaxies and produce even bigger galaxies. There are lots and lots of these images, iconic images, that are where you can see different stages in the mergers of these galaxies with each other. Right? And there's lots of these. OK. If you zoom in on the centers of these merging galaxies, you can find these bright, hot dots. And these bright, hot dots are the massive black holes at the center of these massive galaxies, which presumably, like the galaxies merge and get bigger, presumably these black holes are also merging and getting bigger over time. Right? We have instances where we can see these black holes, supermassive black holes with their jets, locked in a dance with each other as they spiral inwards. And as they spiral inwards, they should be losing energy by emitting gravitational waves. And eventually, they should be merging. So that's how supermassive black holes are born. And now we can put this story together and we can say, OK, so we have supermassive black holes merging. Can we detect gravitational waves from those? Well, what are the time scales? The mergers of these supermassive black holes basically take millions of years or longer. And in fact, the in-spiral phase, the final in-spiral phase takes years. And then there is a ringing phase that takes maybe of the order of a year over which you have this burst. So a year time scale means that the wavelength of the gravitational waves that's emitted, because gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, takes a year, which means it's a light year long wavelength. So now, to detect gravitational waves that are a light year long, we need detectors which have arms which are of the scale of light years. And so now we need to make a detector that is the size of our entire galaxy in order to be able to detect these very low frequency, very long wavelength gravitational waves. How are we going to do that? And this is where, of course, we bring 
the first part of the talk back into the picture, we say, OK, instead of having arms like the LIGO and Virgo detectors, what if we replace these arms by the lines of sight to these radio pulsars in the sky that have very, very stable clocks? Right? And as these very, very stable clocks tick and a gravitational wave passes through them, the line of sight from us to the pulsar is going to stretch and squeeze, stretch and squeeze over a period of years. But it is going to do that. And so the ticks of our clock are going to get closer together and further apart. And if we can time these radio pulsars to very high precision, the gravitational wave strains we are talking about from the mergers of these supermassive black holes are of the order of one part in 10 to the 15th. Right? This is actually substantially larger than what we talked about with the LIGO detectors. Because there we were talking about kilometer long things moving by the size of an atomic nucleus. This is actually a larger strain than that. But that means that it's a change in length of the order of meters over distances of light years. And so we have to be able to time these neutron stars to a precision which corresponds to knowing where they are to a precision of meters over a distance of light years. Right? And that means that we need timing of these pulsars to a precision of tens of nanoseconds over long periods of time. And so this, of course, is an incredible challenge. And when we successfully do this, just like we have different wavelengths of light so that there are x-rays, there are ultraviolet rays, optical, infrared, and radio wavelengths, we will end up with gravitational waves that are detected from the ground of the order of hundreds of cycles per second, gravitational waves that will be eventually detected when we fly detectors like LISA in space, and then gravitational waves that we will be able to detect with these pulsar timing arrays, which are coming from the mergers of supermassive black holes. These are entirely new windows on the universe that are being opened. And the first of these, this now exists, and I have shown you that we are successfully doing this. Um, there's much more that is going to happen on this front. Um, again, a reminder, these gravitational waves are not light. Almost every other way of sensing the universe that we have is a form of light. There are very few other messengers. Some of you know about neutrino astronomy, and that's a different messenger. Gravitational waves are a completely different messenger on the universe. Um, the collaboration that I'm part of is the nanograv collaboration. And I should emphasize that everything I've shown you so far is work by large collaborations, not just of senior people, but lots and lots of students. Here's a picture of the nanograv collaboration um, meeting in front of the Green Bank Radio Telescope, which is one of the radio telescopes that we use. Um, here are lots of our student meeting pictures. Um, and what we are doing, basically, is using these telescopes, which are some of the largest radio telescopes in the world, the Arecibo Observatory, the Green Bank Radio Telescope. And every year, we are timing more of these neutron stars. So what you're seeing in this graph is basically each of these dots represents a pulsar that we are timing over the years. And so every year, we add more pulsars to our detector. That's like adding more arms of our gravitational wave interferometer. And one of the things that we are looking for is we are looking for a correlated change in the timing of these pulsars. We are looking for a change where all the pulsars in this part of the sky appear to speed up a little bit. And all the pulsars in that part of the sky appear to slow down a little bit, and vice versa. And that will tell us that it's not something that's happening with the neutron star. It's not something that's happening as a propagation effect. But instead, it is the stretching and squeezing of space itself that is causing this correlated change in the timing of these neutron stars. And so that's sort of our ongoing enterprise. Um, it's not just us in the United States who are doing this. We have international partners all over the world. This is a global project um, with lots of telescopes around the world, lots of people working on detecting these gravitational waves at low frequencies. I have one technical slide that I thought I'd throw in just to show you where things stand. Okay? This is basically our limit 
on gravitational waves that we have detected so far with 11 years of timing pulsars. We have not yet detected gravitational waves. However, we have theoretical models for the mergers of these supermassive black holes to, in order to get to the universe that it looks like today. And theoretical models say, OK, we should be expecting gravitational waves if we're optimistic in this green band. And you can see that our upper limit, which is the solid black line, has already dug into that green band and sort of ruled it out. Because if, in fact, the optimistic prediction was correct, we should have already detected green. We should have already detected those gravitational waves. The orange band shows what we think is a moderate scenario. The blue band shows what is the most pessimistic scenario. And the black line is where we were with 11 years of data. We, have, we are now working on our 15-year data release, um, and we hope that this line will get pushed substantially further down. Eventually, we know that supermassive black holes exist. And so either we should be detecting this background of gravitational waves, or we should be detecting gravitational waves from the in-spiral of an individual source. On the right-hand side, this is a plot of what our individual source limit looks like. We're looking for the continuous waves from the in-spiral of a pair of supermassive black holes. Okay? Um, the blue line is sort of our sky average sensitivity. The red line is our sensitivity at the most sensitive part of the detector on the sky. Just because of the way our pulsars are distributed, we're more sensitive in some directions compared to other directions. And then the purple dots are a simulation of the universe. They are not the real universe. They are a simulation based on the reality. But we don't know what the gravitational wave universe looks like. That's what we're trying to see. The purple dots show what it would have looked like. And it says that in one simulation of the universe, if there was the right source in the most sensitive part of our detector, we should have already seen it. We have not. Um, but that curve gets lower every time we do a data release. And eventually, we should be able to detect individual gravitational wave sources. This is what our data set looks like now. As I said, every year our data set gets larger because we add more pulsars. And the pulsars we are timing, we time for longer durations. This was our five-year data release. This was our nine-year data release. As I said, we are now working on our 15-year data release. All our data immediately becomes public at data.nanograph.org. Should you want to play with it, it's all right there. Um, again, this is something where lots of people have. And we are actually very proud of the fact that completely independent groups of scientists have taken our data and done interesting astrophysics with it. That is, that is something that makes us very, very happy indeed. OK, so um, where we are on this is we are now approaching a detection of the gravitational wave background. Um, the black line was where we were in 2018. We expect by 2030s we sh will have dug in to the spectrum where realistically sources must exist. Um, and this is opening complementary windows on the gravitational wave spectrum with LIGO, which has already working, and LISA, which does not exist yet except on paper, but will eventually fly in space and fill in the gap between us. Okay. So that's where we stand with gravitational waves. As I said, every year we are looking for more pulsars. And we are adding to our detector. And while we build this detector, um, interesting things pop up. right? Um, I already showed you Jocelyn Bell and her discovery of radio pulsars, which was this little bit of scruff in the radio sky that she went back to over and over and realized that it was a radio pulsar. There's another famous signal like this, which, is, which goes by the name of the wow signal. Um, this is just a one-off signal that was detected in 1977 um, at the Big Ear Telescope, where basically the telescope, it, this is a primitive system back then, um, it prints out either nothing or one to show the level of noise. Right? And it's usually nothing or one, and then the occasional twos or threes, maybe fours. And then suddenly it goes into 5J, U, Q, E, um, this massive signal that comes through. And it gets circled in a red pen. And wow, um, it's famous as the wow signal. It's never been redetected. As I said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This, 
Our best guess now is that it is some form of interference. It is very, very probably not aliens. Um, <laughs> we don't know. Until it's reproduced, we will never know. Similar to this um, is this idea of these fast radio bursts. So the fast radio bursts are these millisecond flashes of radio waves that seem to pop off all over the sky. And because they're radio waves and the space is not a perfect vacuum, space is a better vacuum than anything we can produce on Earth. It's a pretty darn good vacuum, but it's not a perfect vacuum. And so the radio waves don't travel at precisely the speed of light in a vacuum. They travel slightly slower depending on the frequency. And so you end up with these swept pulses where the higher frequencies arrive slightly earlier, the lower frequencies arrive slightly later, and that tells you that it's propagated through a huge amount of space to get to us. Right? And there are these millisecond flashes of radio waves. The initial detection was at the Parkes Radio Telescope, um, which became famous. Um, this is a very, very famous detection of this fast radio burst. Um, there's, there's lots of stories to tell here, but I'm just going to move along and tell you about the one that I have worked the most on that is close to my heart. Um, it is this completely unimpressive looking little patch here. This is a fast radio burst that was detected at the Arecibo Radio Telescope. You can barely even see it. Right? It's barely there. This gives you a little bit of a sense of the data processing challenge that we face. Because here I have highlighted the one section of the data where the fast radio burst I already know is existing. Um, if on this scale, the actual observation data set would stretch for miles. Right? And we just have to go through that. We effectively take lots and lots of survey data. And I like to describe that as it's not just looking for a needle in a haystack. It's looking for a needle in a haystack that is full of needles. Because there's lots and lots of interfering signals that have to be figured out and discarded in order to find one with the correct characteristics for these fast radio bursts. Um, this is one of those challenges where some of you should be thinking, oh, machine learning, I wonder if it could help. It can help, and I am here, I would be glad to talk to some of you about what we can do and what we have done and what we should be doing, um, just in case some of you are interested in talking to me about it. Um, but this was a fast radio burst, and so what produces that, we don't know. Um, we have lots of good ideas. In fact, we have so many good ideas that there were many more ideas for what these things could be than there were examples of these things. Um, not joking. There really were many more models than there were theories. Um, the bulk of them consisted of things that explode, things that go boom, which produce these flashes. Um, in what, is, what has gone down among our collaboration as one of the most amazing email subject lines ever, a graduate student, Paul Schultz, sent out this email to our collaboration saying a minor point of interest um, about this burst that Laura Spittler had discovered before. And the minor point of interest was that this particular direction in the sky was producing multiple bursts. And it was a repeating source. Now at one stroke, the fact that it's a repeating source tells you that it cannot be a cataclysmic event. It has to be something where the engine survives the process and comes back and produces more of them. Okay. Um, the other thing it tells you is, well, if it's a repeating source, then unlike every other fast radio burst till that point, we know where to go fishing for more of them. And so the large circles here are the detection beams at the Arecibo radio telescope. Those are the beams in which it was detected. And you can see that Arecibo, even though it's a large radio telescope, it's a single dish telescope, it has a fairly large patch within which there are lots of sources. And we don't know which of these is the source that's emitting this fast radio burst. Um, what we can do, though, and it's this, this patch of sky is full of hundreds of these sources. What you can do is you can go to the Jansky Very Large Array, which is an interferometer, and that lets you make a more detailed map of the sky with much higher resolution. And then you can go and you can run it like a movie camera. And you can make images of the sky at 200 frames per second, a terabyte of data every hour. And you can keep taking this data, which makes them very, very anxious because that's not how this instrument is meant to be used. Um, but 
we go, this is really exciting. You've got to give us some time. And so we actually were successful in getting a lot of time at this very large array. Um, it's a whole other story, a whole other talk. But basically, in one of these millisecond frames of the sky, we finally caught one of these fast radio bursts. And so what you're seeing here is what the sky looks like in a five millisecond image. There's just nothing there except for this very, very bright fast radio burst popping off. And now you can go back and go to the whole image of the sky and you can say, OK, so where was the source? It's right there. So that source is emitting this fast radio burst. And then you can basically go and you can study what that source is. And strikingly, um, you, we, this is a picture of the Gemini Observatory where we went to get deeper images at optical wavelengths of the sky. And we could find that it was this tiny little fuzzy blob, a puny dwarf galaxy, unlike all the other galaxies that I've shown you so far, which was responsible for producing this fast radio burst. Um, we can measure how far away it is because the light from that, fast, uh, from that host galaxy is redshifted. As the universe expands, the spectral lines from that galaxy appear at different wavelengths. So that's a Doppler shift just like you get when you have a car honking moving by you. That shift, that's the Doppler shift. And just like that, these wavelengths of light are redshifted. So we can infer how far away that galaxy is. It turns out to be 3 billion light years away. And then in other work that I won't have time to tell you about, we have figured out that it comes, it's embedded in a region of extremely high magnetic fields. So this is this completely mysterious little thing. There are lots of questions about fast radio bursts that we cannot answer yet. We have lots of theories. As I said, we have, we until recently had more theories than we have examples. Now we have more examples. Um, there's lots of possibilities. We're pretty, pretty sure that it's not aliens. We don't yet understand whether all of them repeat, whether they're cosmological, where the nearby ones are. But what I will leave you with is this idea that there are new telescopes, new instruments, and there's lots of ongoing work. We need to find more of these bursts. There are very large data sets that we are trying to mine to look for these things. Um, and then once we find more of them, we can use them to probe the universe and find out more about both what they are and what makes up the universe around us. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, so you mentioned earlier that things like, um, you know, pairs of neutron stars or pairs of black holes lose energy to gravitational waves. So does this imply that one can convert energy into gravitational waves somehow? Yes. I mean, gravitational waves carry energy. These ripples in space-time, they're just carrying away energy. And so as they carry away energy, because energy can't be created or destroyed, it just is converted from one form to another, what you're doing is you're converting the kinetic energy of the orbit into gravitational wave energy. And therefore, the orbit must shrink as it loses energy. right? And so um, with supermassive black holes merging, we think that initially it's just things like gas drag and in three-body interactions where you have, for example, dense clusters of stars, and inside it, these black holes are spiraling in towards each other, and then a star gets too close and it gets ejected at very high speed, it picks up that speed and therefore the orbit shrinks a little bit. Eventually, you run out of those stars. Then there's gas drag, where as they spiral in, there's gas drag, the gas gets heated up. Eventually, that gas is all accreted onto those supermassive black holes. And then what's left behind is these two supermassive black holes orbiting each other um, with nothing to break them. And that used to be called the final parsec problem, where the last parsec, we don't know how they would actually get around to merging with each other. We believe that we have resolved the final parsec problem. That is no longer a problem in these simulations. Um, and then as they merge, they emit gravitational waves to carry away energy. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. So you mentioned that you use um, the shrinking and the expanding of space to detect these mm -hmm. gravitational waves, right? 
Uh, so why not just use the gravitational pull on the objects? Yeah, um, that's that's a good question. And um, so the initial idea of how to detect gravitational waves, there were all of these detector models. Like there were these bar detectors where the bar would be deflected a little bit. Um, they run into problems. I mean, first of all, it's incredibly hard to get something to hold still well enough so that you can actually measure the minuscule deflections that we're talking about. Even with LIGO, people give entire talks about just the arrangement of lasers and mirrors at LIGO. The mirrors at the ends of these tubes are suspended so that they're completely decoupled from everything else. Because remember, if they were connected to the detector arms themselves, um, all of the vibrations would go through to them. So you have to decouple them from all of the environment somehow. And so then really, most of the other ways you can think of will run into the problem that your meter stick also shrinks and expands as space stretches and expands. So you need a meter stick that is independent of the stretching and squeezing of space. And really, the only way we've come up with that's a reliable way to do that is to compare two different directions, two different meter sticks against each other. And then for the gravitational waves I was talking about, which are very, very low frequency gravitational waves with very, very long wavelengths, you need to do this over light year scales. Thank you. So it's not yeah. impossible, but it's just not reliable enough. It's not technically feasible. In fact, I mean, I would say it is technically impossible. It is it, conceptually, it is not. But technically, I think it is impossible. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned the fast radio burst that repeated. Yes. How frequently did it repeat? That's a great question um, because the initial detection was in 2012, or well, it was earlier than that, but we analyzed the data and found it in 20, uh, the detection was in 2012, um, even though we found it two years later in analysis of the data. And then every year we'd go back to the telescope and we'd take some more observations um, and we'd see nothing, and we'd go back and see, take some more data, and we'd see nothing, until we finally started seeing it. So um, the repetition is sporadic and completely unpredictable so far. With a sensitive enough telescope, it looks like when it is active, this particular source, we can find maybe one burst every couple of hours of observation time. But that's very source dependent, and that's very telescope dependent. If you have a more sensitive telescope, you can find weaker bursts. Um, so yeah, we've looked very hard for some kind of periodicity in the repetition, because that's immediately the obvious thing we jump to, is could this be some kind of rotation model that we can fit to it? If not a rotating neutron star, could it be things orbiting around each other could it be something like that? So far, we have not been able to find any periodicity in the repetition. It is sporadic. Hey, thanks a lot for coming today. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the precision of measurements you're working with. Um, sorry for my ignorance in advance. <laughs> do, do the gravitational waves participate in the interference? And if they do, how would that affect the precision of the measurements you're working with? And won't it um, produce any false alarms while you are working on detection of the supermassive black holes? The question is whether the gravitational waves are participating um, in the interference. OK. Um, I did not go into the technical details here, but that's actually a very interesting question. Um, because for these gravitational waves, there's two terms. We call them the Earth term and the pulsar term. Mm -hmm. um, the Earth is sitting at the middle of this detector. And so the gravitational wave hits the Earth and causes, effectively, the space to imagine it stretches a little bit. And so then all of the pulsars in this part of the sky will look like they've speeded up a little bit. All the pulsars in that part of the sky look like they've slowed down a little bit. And then there is a term which is for pulsar, which is when the gravitational wave hits one of the pulsars. That pulsar, the line of sight between it and the Earth is stretched a little bit. And therefore, that pulsar speeds up or slows down, but not the rest of them. Right? So effectively, what you're saying there is, I think, 
is how it works, except the term that we are more sensitive to is the Earth term because that's correlated across all of the pulsars. Some will speed up, some will slow down. The pulsar term is a per pulsar thing, and that's really hard because you can never really be sure that you've detected a gravitational wave effect as opposed to something along the line of sight, some refractive effect, some electromagnetic effect, or some weird thing in the pulsar itself. So as far as we understand it, our initial detection is going to be a detection of the Earth term, the Earth bobbing up and down in the gravitational wave background, effectively. Except it's not bobbing up and down, it's bobbing in 3D space in a fourth dimension. Um, yeah, um, but we'll detect that before we detect individual pulsar terms. So maybe that gets to the question you're asking. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the very yeah. interesting talk. Uh, and this may be a naive question, but it seems like all of the detectors that you mentioned, whether it's LIGO, Virgo, or the pulsar-based detection, it's predicated on the assumption that the speed of light is constant, and that's what you're using to detect <laughs> gravitational waves. Yes. So I guess, why is that uh, absolute um, theory? That, that, that's, that's absolutely correct. But remember, um, the existence of gravitational waves is a consequence of Einstein's theory of relativity and general relativity. And according to that theory, the speed of light is a constant. So in that sense, it is, it is a closed loop. Now, there, are, there have been periodically these theories of tired light, or what if the speed of light was changing as a function of time. Um, so far, the theory, uh, GR is tested extensively on many, many, many different scales. right? And it seems to hold up really well to the precision that we can attain so far. Um, if it turns out not to hold, I think that'll be tremendously exciting to us. Um, this is why people still continue to propose tests of GR. When we, anytime we find a binary pulsar, the first thing we do is, okay, can we use this to test GR and push the precision one more step forward? Um, that's becoming increasingly hard now because GR is tested so well. It seems to work on scales all the way from GPS satellites orbiting the Earth to these distant universe things. So, so far we have no grounds to question it. Um, but we are testing. We are not willing to take that on faith because anyone who shows that this theory does not work, you bet they're going to go for that. That is going to be really, really good news for them. Bad news for the rest of us, maybe like, okay, lots of work to be done, but that, that's what gets us excited, right? I mean, this is something that I think people get wrong about scientists in general. We are, we are the opposite of invested in our theories. The way to get ahead is to show that your favorite theory is wrong, because that is guaranteed to push the state of the art forward. Uh, we are the opposite of invested in it. We want to show that things are wrong. Um, but yeah, so far it holds up. Thank you. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, can you use gravitational waves to determine anything about the source, um, such as like what element the source is made of, or anything like that matter? Um, that's, that's a great question. You wouldn't probably use it to determine what the source is made of, but what you would be able to do, what we are doing in fact right now with the LIGO detections, is we can tell whether, um, like what it was that was merging. So for example, the waveforms look different depending on whether they are black holes merging with each other or neutron stars merging with each other. Neutron stars, as they merge with each other, there are tidal effects. Black holes do not show those tidal effects. And so the waveforms simulated are different. We, we are not yet convinced that we've seen a merger of a neutron star with a black hole. Um, that will produce tidal stretching of the neutron star, but not of the black hole. There are simulations of what those waveforms should look like. Um, so yes, very much so. The waveforms tell you what was going on at the merger. It's a whole new window, a whole new way of looking at the universe.